OPBC Online, a ministry of Old Pass Baptist Church in Northfield, Minnesota. We are live here today. It is 2.09 p.m. Central Time. It is Friday. It is 7-26-2024. And we are going to be talking about the persecuted Baptist and the founding of America. And, uh, you know, how that relates to the founding of America. Uh, also, you know, I'll, I'll kind of give you some historical background, but... but uh, of before that, the, you know, the Great Awakening, a few things like that. We'll talk about that, which, you know, led that. But before the Great Awakening ever took place, there were some Baptist men that came over, founded churches, started that work of preaching the gospel and also individual soul liberty that liberty of conscience and that teaching of being the, the lambs of Christ and not being the, the uh, persecuting lions of Rome or her stepchildren or her bastard children. Those Protestants that persecuted Baptists right here on American soil. So we're going to get into that and talk about that. Let me say hello to everybody. Looks like Ross Duncan's on here. Carl Winters. Becca. Gregory. Mary. Aaron, Teresa, Joey Mack. So anyway, I I uh I was looking I was I was looking I was reading this book. Let's see. Let me see here. Here we go. Here is Grady Publications. I have read Final Authority. I have read Given by Inspiration. I haven't read these yet, but I will. Lord willing. I want to read that one too. What God Hath Wrought. That is the book that I am reading right now. I'm going to read you some portions of that today. Now, This book is a great book on Baptist history, on the Baptist founding of America. Pastor James Beller also wrote American Crimson Red. Another good volume, which is a small volume. Baptist in the South by Lumpkin. Hang on. There we go. Baptist Foundations in the South by William Lumpkin. This is another book. If you would like a condensed version of America in Crimson Red, a very condensed but good outline, read Baptist Foundations in the South. By William Lumpkin. I've read it twice. I've read American and Crimson Red twice. I've read Sacred Betrayal twice. Trail of Blood. I'm reading through J.T. Christian's works. Reading through Armitage's works. 
reading through Orchard's works. Read the History of the Donatist by David Benedict. So lots of good works out there on Baptist works out there. But in focusing on America and understanding the Republic, and what it was founded after and the way that it was designed. This is where men like Chris Pinto fall short. Men like William Marshall, or Peter Marshall, excuse me, fall short. The David Bartons and the and the other people like that, they all fall short of understanding. Which is what my documentary will cover in the Baptist, when I cover that religious tyranny versus the Baptist Bill of Rights. And the upcoming documentary that I'll be working on. This is where their ignorance comes in. They are not aware that men like Thomas Jefferson viewed a Baptist church and watched how that Baptist church was operated. James Madison watched the Baptist church Defended the Baptist in court. How Patrick Henry was a lawyer who was a Presbyterian but believed in freedom of conscience and defended the Baptist in court. Because they were arresting the Baptist. By the way, go buy Grady's book. Go to Grady Publications. I recommend Final Authority. I recommend Given by Inspiration. I recommend What God Hath Wrought. So far, I have not finished it. I'm probably a fourth of the way through it. but I can already tell it's sold out. I have an extra copy that I've given pastor Jeffrey when he comes. He'll be here in September. I'll be giving him a copy. Grady's Books are wonderful. Now, him and I don't agree on every bit of theology. There are some things that we disagree on. But not about the authority of the King James Bible. And certainly we don't disagree about history. So. Anyway, buy his book. Uh, Trek Amazon. Check bookfinder.com and find a used copy. Go to bookfinder.com and check for a used copy. But anyway, to set this up and really understand When you go back to the, the, you know, the pilgrims when they came over, not the dirty Jesuits and the, the others that came over and tried to start Jamestown and other providences and they were a bunch of, and Columbus and wicked men like that that were a bunch of perverts. 
gave syphilis to everybody, brought back syphilis to France and England and Spain and all over the place, raping women over here, killing, killing slaves over here, killing Indians over here. That's what the Jesuits did. That's what the Catholics did like Columbus. Columbus was a big old Catholic turd that needed flushed down the toilet. He's no hero. Neither were those conquistadors. They were wicked men. Men like Bradford that came over were pilgrims. Men later like Roger Williams, the Baptists that came over. Men like John Clark, they come over to the Massachusetts Bay Area in the 1620s and 30s. And they find the Anglican bishops pushing them out. Well, God was beginning in America to do a work of liberty of conscience. See, the Anglicans came over. By the way, the pilgrims were influenced by the Dutch Baptists out of Holland. So when they came, those Dutch Anabaptists had already influenced them. They didn't come here trying to kill people for what they believed. Well, why? Because they were influenced by the Dutch Baptists out of Holland. That's why. Baptist. Baptist didn't kill people for what they believed and didn't spread the faith through the sword unless it was the sword of the spirit which is the word of god so meanwhile Meanwhile, Roger Williams comes over here in the 1620s or so. He's kicked out of the, in 1630s and 40s, he's kicked out of the Massachusetts Bay Area by the Massachusetts Bay Company, the colony. Him and Roger, him and John Clark and Obadiah Holmes, or Obadiah Holmes, excuse me, not Roger Williams. Roger Williams is already banished. John Clark, Obadiah Holmes, we're preaching in the in the Massachusetts area. They baptized their convert over there. They held services. And the Puritans, John Cotton, and those other men kicked them out. But before they did, they find Clark. Clark didn't want the fine paid for, but one of his parishioners paid it for him. Obadiah Holmes took the beating, which we'll get to. But all over those colonies in Virginia, you find the Baptists being persecuted. But Roger Williams, John Clark, Obadiah Holmes all go to New Hampshire. Excuse me. Uh, Rhode Island. They found churches in Rhode Island. They get a charter for liberty of conscience for all. They signed the Portsmouth Compact, voluntary, under Jesus Christ. They do not persecute there. Men are free to worship God according to the dictates of their own heart. So they evangelize the lost.
Some years go by and persecution rises greater and greater in Massachusetts and Virginia. The Anglican and the state church take control of everything. And here's where we kind of pick it up. Whenever Catholics cease to be persecuted in the mother country, discerning colonial leaders would suspicion a potential merger between the Anglican and Roman communions. As early as April 1764, George Whitfield warned his American friends that the king was up to no good and was in fact planning to slip an Anglican bishop into the colonies as a constructive half step back to the Vatican. His words to a couple of Portsmouth ministers had an ominous ring to them. I cannot in good conscience leave the town without acquainting you with a secret. My heart bleeds for America. Oh, poor New England. There is a deep laid plot against both your civil and religious liberties that they will be lost. Your golden days are at an end. You have nothing but trouble before you. My information comes from the best authority in Great Britain. Whitfield's concern over Anglican encroachments touches on a second manner in which the devil was attempting to thwart the providential emergence of American sovereignty. See, the Great Awakening took place right after Williams and those men died, then the Great Awakening, uh, Great Awakening comes. Whitfield preaches and millions of people are converted in America. Whitfield, Edwards, and all those others. Well, men get saved and they become Baptists, a lot of them. Well, that doesn't set well with the standing order churches. You, you mark my words, religious liberty started in Baptist pulpits. It did not start with any Protestants. It started with Baptist. Protestant theology does not agree with soul liberty. The most striking manifestation of this religious tyranny involved the documented cases of numerous Baptist preachers being arrested and imprisoned for the crime of preaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yet a tragedy nearly as sad as the persecution itself is almost the total ignorance of the fact that these events ever occurred in the first place. While it is one thing for the standard fluff-filled God and country books, the light and glory, etc., to avoid these convicting accounts, it is quite another for the average Baptist to be unaware of his own enriching legacy. You know, Baptists are totally ignorant of the fact that Baptists were persecuted in America. They are, they are absolutely, totally ignorant of the fact that Baptists were persecuted in America. They don't even know it. They don't even know their own history. At all. They don't know what happened. They have no clue. During the early years of Virginia's history, no minister was permitted to preach unless he had received ordination from an Anglican bishop across the sea. Attendance at the Episcopalian church was mandatory with absentees being fined 50 pounds of tobacco. With the ascension of William and Mary following England's glorious revolution, this ecclesiastical monopoly was technically dissolved by the Toleration Act of 1689. Dissenting clergy could now apply for a license provided that they would ascribe to the Anglican Articles of Religion, excluding 34, 35, and 36 and a rewording of 20. They would have to denounce the Romish doctrines of transubstantiation and mariality, affirm as abhorrent the Je Jesuit doctrine of political assassination, and swear allegiance to their majesties William and Mary. Under these less-than-ideal conditions, nearly a century of exclusion was ended with the founding of several Baptist churches in Virginia. 
Some of the earliest on record were the assemblies in Prince George, Surrey, and the Isle of Wight. Counties established in 1714. Among the others that followed were those in Berkeley County, Mill Creek, Loudoun County, Kentucky in 1751, Rockingham County. However, it was from a church in another state that a host of preachers came pouring into Virginia, proclaiming Baptist doctrines. Shubal Stearns came. A native of Boston was converted to the preaching of George Whitfield and thereafter united with the pro-revival New Light Movement. However, after pastoring a separate Baptist church, a separate church, excuse me, for six years, he became convinced of the study of the scriptures that infant baptism was a human institution. Accordingly, he was immersed by Elder Waite Palmer at Toland, Connecticut on May 20th, 1751. And ordained into the Baptist ministry three years later, the Holy Spirit led him southward to the Mill Creek Church, where he rendezvoused with his layman brother-in-law, Daniel Marshall, learned, learning to his delight that he too had become one of Whitfield's Baptist ducks. See, Whitfield would comment, all my chicks have turned to ducks. Because with the freedom and liberty of biblical theology to spread through the land, and that there was no, th no such thing as infant baptism in the Bible. Men that got saved got baptized. They, they, found, they read the scriptures. They found a Baptist church. They said, well, I believe that. Only adults, only, only those that make a profession of faith in Christ Jesus, repentance toward God, faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Only they are qualified for baptism. Whitfield would actually leave the North Carolina area and he would pray. God answered his prayer, by the way. He would pray that God would send a John the Baptist out of the wilderness to minister to the Carolinas. And God, who does exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, did just that. He would send Shubal Stearns. to the Carolinas, Virginia, and to all over that area. And a sweeping revival of church planting revival that literally changed the nation. Changed it. The reason there is any semblance today of what we have in America and religious liberty is due to the Baptist church planting. And I will tell you this. The reason we have lost so much foothold in America and around the world is because we've turned from that. During the early years of Virginia history, we find the following years Stearns led a small company of eight families some 200 miles to Sandy Creek in Gulford County, North Carolina. Soon after their arrival on November 22nd, 1755, the Sandy Creek Baptist Church was constituted with 16 members under the anointed leadership of Pastor Stearns. The church quickly grew to a membership of over 600. 
From this holy mission station in North Carolina, numerous churches were planted back in the fertile fields of Virginia. Deep River, Abbott's Creek, Little River, Noose River, Black River, Dan River, Lunenburg City, to name but a few, with multitudes of the resulted converts deserting their dead Episcopalian churches. They left him. The inevitable backlash of historic persecution brought about the most ignominious chapter in Old Dominion history. Throughout this period, Satan tested both the preacher's resolve and the people's reaction by initiating his opposition through an unrestrained rabble of the baser sort. While a preacher's sermon could be interrupted by the unexpected arrival of a snake or a hornet's nest being tossed in through an open window, or the outright smashing to bits of his pulpit and communion table. His baptismal candidates might be scattered in the local creek by a mob of mounted drunks. When one gang violently submerged Reverend David Barrow and a fellow pastor seven times, they dunked him seven times under. When one gang violently submerged Reverend David Barrow and a fellow pastor seven times and then asked him if, if they believed, the exasperated but colorful preacher replied, I believe you're, you mean to drown me. That's what he said to him. I believe you're trying to drown me. See, they... The Holy Ghost had a hold of those Baptist preachers, man. These people are persecuting them. And God's Spirit has a hold of them. David Thomas, a pastor of the church at Broad Run, was an early target of such irreverent harassment. Listen to what these men went through. Outrageous mobs and individuals frequently assaulted and disturbed him. Once he was pulled down as he was preaching and dragged out of doors in a barbarous manner. At another time, a malevolent fellow attempted to shoot him. But a bystander wrenched the gun from him and thereby prevented the execution of his wicked purpose. The slanders and revilings, says Mr. Edwards, which he met with, are innumerable. And if we may judge a man's prevalency against the devil by the rage of the devil's children, Thomas prevailed like a prince. They just attacked him. Pulled guns on him. See, you're never so over the target when persecution like this arises. A notable trophy of his period, of this period, was Samuel Harris, a, colon a colonel in the Virgi Virginia militia. He was in the Virginia militia and one time commander of Fort Mayo. Taylor recounts the thrilling roadside encounter of his 18 of this 18th century Cornelius with the preaching team of siblings Joseph and William Murphy, the Murphy boys. As the people were collecting, Colonel Harris rode up, splendidly attired in his military habit. What is to be done here, gentlemen? said Colonel Harris. Preaching, Colonel. Well, who is to preach? The Murphy boys, sir. Well, I believe I'll stop and hear them. He dismounted. The house was small. And in the corner stood a, a loom, behind which the colonel seated himself. The Lord's eye was upon him, and the truth became effectual in deepening his convictions. Such was his agony of mind 
that at the close of the meeting, his sword and other parts of his regimentals were found scattered around him. Baptized in 1758 by Daniel Marshall, the colonel himself took to preaching the following year. Little writes, Rough was the treatment which Mr. Harris met with amongst his rude countrymen. On one occasion while he was preaching in a house, an enraged mob smashed down the front door and a violent altercation ensued. Although Colonel Harris would eventually be jailed in Hillsborough, Loudoun County, and kept for some time, the distinction of being the first Baptist minister to be imprisoned in the state of Virginia for preaching the gospel fell upon one of his personal converts. Lewis Craig, a notorious sinner, was awakened under the ministry of Colonel Harris sometime around the year 1765. Having begun his own preaching immediately thereafter, a new church was soon established in Spotsylvania. However, his zeal for Christ drew the unwanted attention of several magistrates who promptly arrested him in 1766 for keeping unlawful conventicles or meetings and worshiping God contrary to the law of the land. Although indicated, this first clash with the authorities did not result in his notable incarceration. While the jury for his trial was in recess at a nearby tavern, the defendant showed up and made them all wish they were in another place. So Lewis Craig comes into the tavern where these guys are all sitting. The jury. And he goes in there and he starts to preach to them. Here's what he does. Gentlemen, I thank you for your attention to me. When I was about this courtyard, in all kind of vanity, folly, and vice, you took no notice of me. But when I have forsaken all these vices and warned men to forsake and repent of their sins, you bring me to the bar as a transgressor. How is all this? The great solemnity of this address filled the hearers with dismay. And Mr. John Waller, one of the jurors, a very wicked man, became so struck that he never got rest till he found it in the Lord and became one of the most successful preachers that was ever in Virginia and was oftentimes honored with a prison for his preaching. See, they used to call him Swearing Jack Waller because he was one of these rebel rousers like Lewis Craig. But Lewis Craig gets saved. Lewis Craig preaches. You start to see, huh? You start to see a pattern here. It's not happening through the ballot box. No, it happens through the gospel, through the hearts of, uh, through the gospel, the power of God in the hearts of men to change them. Wicked men care nothing for justice. Wicked men care, care nothing for righteousness. Men must be born again to be good judges. They must judge righteous judgment. So here's this drunkard, Lewis Craig, gets saved, gets put on trial for preaching a gospel, preaching the gospel, organizing a church meeting without the licensing and approval of the Anglicans. But the Anglicans weren't seeing any lives changed. So one of the jurors hears Lewis Craig's testimony in the bar, in the tavern, which probably was an eating, it could have been an eating facility too as well, because a lot of them, just like they are now. Lewis Craig goes in there, tells the man, you all loved me when I was a rebel rouser, when I was a drunkard. Now you hate my guts because I'm preaching for men to repent. 
Waller gets swearing Jack Waller. Gets so convicted. That he walks around in turmoil until he finds peace in Christ and is born again. And what's he do? He starts preaching the gospel. See that? Now, Lewis Craig's subsequent acquittal and release was short-lived because on June 4th, 1768, Pastor Craig and four fellow laborers, one of whom being John Waller, the converted juror from the last trial, were arrested on charges of disturbing the peace. Ah! And herein lies the real issue. Disorderly conduct and disturbing the peace. This is what they like to charge Baptist preachers with. If you're preaching the gospel out on the streets, you disturb their peace. And that's what they accuse us of. We Baptist preachers go out and preach in the highways and the byways, at pride events, in front of concerts, at sporting events, in Vanity Fair. And what do they tell us? You are disturbing the peace. This is disorderly conduct. Really? So the sodomites, the queers, the naked people running through the streets, that's not disorderly conduct. But me preaching the gospel of the Son of God and calling all men everywhere to repentance is disorderly conduct. See, I love reading these accounts of these preachers. Their persecution, their preaching. Why? Well, because I identify with them. Right? And I see these things are still going on today. Pastor Jeffrey just sent me an article. At the last Pride event, there was a man walking around buck naked. Completely naked. And they said it was not expedient for them to arrest him. And I was like, but Pastor Jeffrey was standing outside of a Santa Claus parade and he was preaching the gospel, and it was expedient for you to arrest him? See, so he understands that. Ross Duncan understands it. Ross Duncan understands standing out there and the gospel being preached. Men persecuting you. They were arrested on charges of disturbing the peace. Although it is doubtful that a law ever existed in Virginia that authorized imprisonment for preaching per se, the statutes for preserving peace and order were so constructed that men of God were routinely arrested and jailed through means of a peace warrant. Wait, you mean they like, they craftily writ, wrote the law so preachers were the ones that were disturbing the peace? So they could say, you're not going to jail for, you're not getting a ticket for preaching. You're getting a ticket because your amp is too loud. There again. There again. You talking about ambient noise. There again said the chief of police to me up there, up north there. There again. You keep using that ambient noise. 
There ain't nothing in this ordinance about ambient noise. Well, I'm sorry there, Chiefy Weefy, but you better figure out what ambient noise is there, genius. Since you're getting paid probably a hundred grand a year to be the chief of police, the good people of Golden Valley ought to be able to trust the fact that you know what ambient noise is. There again. So, the prosecuting attorney addressed the court accordingly. May it please your worships that these men are great disturbers of the peace. They cannot meet a man upon the road, but they must ram a text of scripture down his throat. End quote. Bravo. Amen. They cannot meet a man but that he must ram a text of scripture down his throat. Ah. He thinks we identify with those men. What a wonderful thing to go to jail for. Right? Right, my good man. Smashing reason. Smashing, I tell you. First Peter chapter 4. Verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice. Inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. But if ye be reproached, excuse me, not but, but if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. But then let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody into other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. This time the preachers were found guilty on all accounts as the condemned prisoners passed through the streets of Fredericksburg on their way to Spotsylvania County Jail, which I believe I've been through. In fact, I know I'm, I'm I could say, yeah, I've been to Spotsylvania. Yeah, I've, I've been there. Yeah. Pretty sure. Their voices suddenly united in song causing what Dr. Semple said was an awful appearance on all who did hear. By the way, Spotsylvania County never jailed another preacher again. Here's the song they sang. Broad is the road that leads to death, and thousands walk together there, but wisdom shows a narrow path with here and there a traveler. Deny thyself and take thy cross is the Redeemer's great command. Nature must count her gold but dross if she would gain this heavenly land. The fearful soul that tires and faints and walks the way, ways of God no more is but esteemed almost a saint and makes his own destruction sure. Lord, let not all my hopes be vain. Create my heart entirely new, which hypocrites could ne'er attain, which false apostates never knew. Furthermore, these men of God were imprisoned despite an impassioned defense by the famed patriot lawyer Patrick Henry. Although the traditional wording of Henry's speech is often disputed by historians, the fact of his presence 
at the trial con is conceded by many authorities, including W.W. Henry in his life of Patrick Henry. At any rate, not only did Henry make it a point to defend as many Baptist preachers as he could, but he did so at his own expense, often praying whatever fines which may have ensued out of his own pocket. In Semple's History of the Virginia Baptist, he gives us the following tribute. Bummer. Let me see. It looks like I'm still streaming fine. I still have a... It looks like I'm streaming fine. Not sure. In Semple's History of the Virginia Baptist, which I do have, by the way, he thinks. Yes. Anyway. It was in making these attempts that they were so fortunate as to interest in their behalf the celebrated Patrick Henry. Being always the friend of liberty, he only needed to be informed of their oppression. Without hesitation, he stepped forward to their relief. From that time until their complete emancipation from the shackles of tyranny, the Baptist found in Patrick Henry an unwavering friend. May his name descend to posterity with unsullied honor. See, Patrick Henry loved the Baptists, and he supported them and their cause for religious liberty. And the Baptists were saw he was a friend to them, and they were the, his friends, and he he loved them and cared for them, and he always defended them. What you have to understand is there would be no Baptist Bill of Rights. without Roger Williams, John Clark, Obadiah Holmes, Patrick Henry, who wasn't a Baptist, but was a friend of them. Without the separate Baptist revival, there would be no John Leland who would challenge James Madison. John Leland, let me show you the opposite of what took place. Okay. And I'm, I'll cover it again some other time, but, but, and I'm not done reading this. This is, these are good accounts, but I'm trying to explain to you. John Leland came from the separate Baptist revival. Three men away from Schubel Stearns. John Leland did not go and beg James Madison to support him or to stand up for their cause. No. There were so many Baptist in Orange County that John Leland said, I'm going to run for office and defeat you. And I'm going to defeat you because there is no Bill of Rights protecting individual soul liberty, liberty of conscience, a Baptist distinctive. given by God. So because if there isn't one, I'm going to run against you, Madison. I'm going to defeat you. And you guys won't be able to ratify a constitution. And Madison knew that Orange County was Baptist County. And Orange County, Virginia, 
ran the the state. The projective state. He knew it. He knew that if Leland and those Baptists weren't supportive, nothing was happening. So he went to Leland. And he begged Leland not to run. And said that he would put in a Bill of Rights. And he did just that. But that wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for a number of things that took place. All spiritual things. All biblical things. Okay? All of them. It would not have happened. So that's what took place there. The patriot who said, give me liberty or give me death, and was subsequently elected to five terms of governor of Virginia, was perhaps the most outspoken of his political peers with respect to the specific spiritual foundations of these United States. It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians, not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. For this very reason, people of other faiths have been afforded asylum, prosperity, and freedom of worship here. Why? Because gospel, the gospel doesn't mandate you killing people. In fact, it mandates the opposite. Okay. It's the opposite. There are many today who would add insult to injury by their disregard, playing down or outright denying that these events ever occurred. Despite the natural deterioration of many court records, a number of surviving documents bear testimony to this deplorable persecution that Christians went through. Baptists went through preaching the gospel. or for missing church, we present Gowan Corbin, Esquire for willfully absent, absenting himself from divine service at his parish church or chapel for the space of one month. County Court for Middlesex, Monday, May 27, 1771. How about for preaching without a license? Augustine Easton, appearing according to his reconnaissance and it appearing that he had practiced Preaching in this county as a Baptist, not having a license. The court adjudging to be a breach of good behavior and contrary to the law, whereupon it is ordered that he enter into recognizance for being of good behavior for the space of one year next and suing himself in the penalty of 50 pounds and two sureties in penalty of 25 pounds each and that he be committed till he do so. County Court for Chesterfield County. For holding church. For preaching the Son of God. For preaching without a license. Oh. For preaching without permission. A license is permission. Granted.
it's permission granted. It means they're permitting you to do something. This is why, as a pastor, I will not become a 501c3. I will not, by God's grace, enter into articles of incorporation for Old Paz Baptist Church. We will not accept the tax identification number. We won't do it. Why? I don't need their permission to operate. This is why all these COVID-19, when, when that was going on, all the Baptist churches that were 501c3s were shutting down and obeying the government, staying shut down. After about three weeks, I was like, no, we're not doing that. This isn't the Black Plague. If we have to shut down for health, we'll do it. But until then, we won't have the government tell us what to do. But see, they have to, technically speaking, they have to obey public policy. They signed articles of incorporation and they state that they will obey public policy. COVID-19 is public policy. Masks and everything, that was all public policy. For assembling the people, Pastor David Tinsley being committed, charged with having assembled and preached to the people at sundry times and in places in this county as a Baptist preacher. And the said David acknowledging in court that he had done so on consideration thereof, the court being of opinion that the same is a breach of the peace and good behavior. It is ordered that he gives surety for keeping the peace and being of good behavior for one year next and suing himself in the penalty of 50 pounds and two sureties in the penalty of 25 pounds each. County Court for Chesterfield, February 4th, 1774. In their camaraderie of affliction, these Virginia Baptists were strengthened by a vicarious appreciation of their first century forefathers who rejoiced on a daily basis that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. All right, we're going to take a break for a second here and just play a song, give you a chance to reflect on some of those things, and then we're going to get right back to it here. So let's see.
as I travel through life with its trouble and strife, I have a glorious hope to get cheer on the way. Soon my toil will be o'er, and I'll rest on that shore where the night has been turned into day. Up in that beautiful paradise valley by the side of the The sweet flowers that grow in the dale A faint picture is there Of a land bright and fair Where perennial flowers may fail Up, up in the beautiful paradise valley By the side of the river of, river of life up in, up in the valley The wonderful valley will be free From all pain and all strife There we shall live to compare with the flowers that bloom in the garden above in the midst of it grows Sharon's perfect sweet rose is the wonderful flower we love up in, up in the beautiful paradise valley by the side of the river of life up in, up in the valley the wonderful valley will be free from all pain and all strife Garden in the shade of the evergreen tree. How I long for the paradise, paradise valley where the beauty of heaven I'll see. Amen. Okay, let's keep going here. When Pastor Joseph Craig of Spotsylvania County climbed a tree in the local swamp to evade a pack of yelping hounds. The pursuing magistrate shook him to the ground as if he were a wild beast. They sent the hounds after the preacher. Pastor John Waller was given not much less than 20 lashes with a horse whip by the sheriff in Caroline County. An eyewitness to the attack testified that poor Waller was presently in a gore of blood and will carry the scars to his grave. This is Protestant persecution. These holy men were likewise abused in the courtroom as well. After his third arrest for preaching the gospel, Pastor Jeremiah Moore was flatly told by the judge, you shall lie in jail till you rot or obey the law. Wow. As our Savior was compelled to carry his own cross to Calvary, likewise his servants in colonial Virginia had to suffer the humiliation of renting the very beds in which they were consigned to rot. The Culpeper Jail offered bed and furniture at $5 a month. Their cells were often infested with spiders and mice, and their meals were seldom much better. Concerning his month-long imprisonment with fellow preachers in the Culpeper Jail, Pastor Elijah Craig testified that they were fed on rye bread and water to the injury of their health. For the record, the word gal is used in the original documents and court records of that day was the designated place of confinement for criminals. Frequently misspelled goal, it was anything but the objective point of terminus that men were striving to reach. The magistrates tried to further unnerve the preachers by assigning them depraved cellmates. 
This ploy would often backfire, however, with the conversion of many in 18th century Onesimus. In fact, the entire persecution blew up in Satan's face as the word of God increased and the number of the disciples multiplied. Look at that in Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles. Remember, so uh, pretty soon Stephen's going to get persecuted. What's going to happen is priests are going to get saved. They're going to turn from Judaism to Christianity and be saved. These Anglicans, the same thing happened. A lot of these Anglican people, they turned to repent and believe the gospel and became Baptist. Why? Because they saw the power of God on these men. Between the years 1769 and 1774, the number of Baptist churches in Virginia grew from 7 to 54. Remember, there's not that many people in Virginia at the time. There's not that many people even there. Much of their growth was attributed to the glowing testimonies of the afflicted. Dr. Semple, describing the spirit of four jailed preachers in Middlesex, he writes this. This is what they did in jail. Are you listening? This is what they were going through. The prison swarmed with fleas. They borrowed a candle of the jailer. And having sung the praises of that redeemer, whose cross they bore, and from whose hands they expected a crown in the end, having returned thanks that it was a prison and not hell that they were in, praying for themselves, their friends, their enemies, and their persecutors, they laid down to sleep. What they they prayed and gave praise to God that they were sitting in a jail cell and not in hell. Let me tell you something, friend. You may be in a prison of afflictions, but you can thank God that you're in that prison of affliction and you are not in hell, which is what you deserve and I deserve. Six days after his arrival in the Culpeper County Jail, Pastor Nathaniel Saunders received the following letter of encouragement from the previously mentioned David Thomas. So David Thomas is writing a brother in Christ, a pastor that's in jail. I mean, this reminds me of, you know, when Pastor Jeffrey went to jail. And the police were persecuting him, are persecuting him, and were persecuting him. When he told me, I encouraged him. I said, man, now I want to come to Canada even more. Now I know why God wants me to go to Canada. Because they threw him in jail for preaching the gospel. Second Timothy chapter one, verse number 16. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesephorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain.
When he told me he went to jail for preaching the gospel, I wasn't ashamed of his chain. Amen. So here's this dear brother that writes this other pastor. But you know something? A lot of Pastor Jeffrey's other pastors in Canada don't have nothing to do with him. When him and Luke went to a preacher's meeting and told them that they had been arrested or they, they had been hassled by the cops, they all looked at him like they had three eyeballs. And here Luke thought, man, these guys are going to be supportive. Say, oh, brother, we'll pray for you. And man, I'm sorry to hear that. They all acted like they were serial rapists or something. They looked at, these fundies all looked at them like, like there was something wrong with them. Why'd they do that? Because they're taught Romans 13, man, you obey the you obey the law. A perversion of Romans 13. That's what they're taught. So they looked at him like a bullfrog in a hailstorm, man. Like they got some disease. Luke thought they were going to be encouraging, and Pastor Jeffrey had to tell him, hey, Luke, these guys, they don't get it, man. You, Me, I put my arm around him and hug him and thank God for him. Maybe that's because I wasn't cut from some stupid Bible college mold mold maybe that's why because by the grace of God I identify with these men so he writes his dear brother he said dear brother I hear you are put in prison for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ Perhaps you think it hard, but oh, what honor the Lord put upon you. I think you may be willing to suffer death now, seeing you are counted worthy to enter a dungeon for your master's sake. Hold out, my dear brother. Remember your master, your royal, heavenly, divine master, was nailed to a cursed tree for us. Oh, to suffer for him is glory in the bud. Oh, let it never be said that a Baptist minister of Virginia ever wronged his conscience to get liberty, not to please God, but himself. Oh, your imprisonment, which I am satisfied is not from any rash proceedings on your own, is not a punishment, but a glory. If you suffer with him, you shall also reign with him. Dear brother, the bearer is waiting, or I should have enlarged. This is only to let you know that I can pray for you with great freedom. Give my kind love to your fellow prisoner, though I know him not. I hope he is a dear child of God. Pray for me, for I need it. I remain your brother, yours in our dear Lord Jesus, David Thomas. However, the most convicting and sensational facet of this entire period occurred just outside the prison bars themselves when the preachers could no longer go to the people. The congregations boldly come, came to the jails. Listen. There was so much revival and sweeping through the remnants of the Great Awakening and church planting that was happening and this persecution. So much.
that it affected the people around them. That the people, when they found out their pastor was in jail, they didn't run and quit the church and go gossip about their pastor. Or make YouTube videos about them or... They would sit outside the jail cell to hear him preach because they were hungry for the words of God. They were hungry to hear the gospel preached. So they would sit outside. When preachers could no longer go to the people, the congregations boldly came to the jails. The grates were the sturdy iron bars that ran perpendicularly perpendicularly, or horizontally or sometimes both ways across the small windows or openings in the wall of a cell in which the prisoner was being held. Some of the most powerful sermons in the history of the New Testament church were preached through these very grates. Dr. Little expounds, who would have thought that stopping these men from preaching from house to house and shutting them up in a loathsome prison would be the means of their reaching more people with the gospel and accomplishing more good than they could possibly have done if they had been at liberty. But it was so ordered of God, they collected larger congregations and accomplished more in spreading their views and in winning souls to Christ than they probably could have done had they been let alone. Their enemies were helping them more than they were hindering them in promulgating the truth and advancing the kingdom of Christ. Think about that. As we darken the cages of our birds when we desire them to sing, these anointed men of God, jailbirds in the eyes of some, Possess their own songs in the night. However, not everybody was in the listening mood. Their persecutors ordered a drum to be beat under the windows. Hey, does this sound familiar, guys? Does this sound familiar? How many times have we been preaching in Minneapolis? I don't know if any of my men are on here right now. But how many times have we been preaching in Minneapolis and, and, and the guys bring the drums out and they start drumming around us to drown us out. Did you think that was just us? Did you think that was just new and modern? The persecutors ordered a drum to be beat under the windows in order to drown their voices. But no jangle of drums could equal the force and volume of their utterances. As they eloquently proclaimed the gospel of the Son of God, sanctified lungs overpowered the rattle of dried sheepskin. Above all the hubbub swelled the clear tones of these fearless orators of freedom and truth. The people heard them and the faithful were strengthened and the scoffers were confounded, convinced, and converted. Many of the men that would try to drown out the preachers would end up being converted. They'd be saved. As the number of incarcerated pastors at any one jail increased, so did the unwanted pandemonium and publicity at preaching time. So in other words, basically, there'd be preaching times and large crowds would show up outside of the jail cell to hear the preachers preach. A woman recalls her childhood visits to the Caroline County Jail where her grandfather, Pastor John Young, and a number of other preachers were confined. 
Here's what she said. Each preacher was in a room of himself, to himself. Each room had one small window placed so high up in the wall that only a patch of the sky could be seen, nothing on the earth. The congregations of the different ministers learned each, which was his pastor's window. Once a week, John Young's congregation, and I suppose the others too, would assemble under his window and run up a flag to let him know they were there. And he would preach to them in this way. A great many people were converted, the authorities said. These heretics make more converts in jail than they do out. The jailer was so incredibly frustrated, right? He's frustrated with the fact that they throw these men in jail. And people would line up outside the jails. People would be converted. People would be baptized. Not by their preacher, but another preacher would come and baptize those people that wanted to be, pre wanted to be in the local New Testament church. The incensed officials in Chesterfield County were determined to hinder the powerful preaching of Pastor John Weatherford. After failing to discourage their victims by slashing his outstretched hands with a sword. So when he stuck his hands out, they would slash him with a sword. For what? Preaching. They constructed a massive brick wall, nearly 12 feet in height, directly outside his cell gate. They even went to the trouble of lining the top of the wall with glass bottles set in mortar so as to prevent the more daring listeners from employing the strategic perch. However, the resourceful Weatherford devised a plan to overcome their foolish designs, as in the case of Caroline County. Here's what he did. A handkerchief was to be raised by the congregation on a pole above the wall as a signal that the people were ready to hear. His voice being very strong, he could throw it beyond the impediments and convey the words of life and salvation to the listening crowd. Souls were blessed and converted by his preaching. Of those who felt they had experienced the renovating influence of divine grace, Nine wished to follow their master by being buried in baptism. Elder Christian Chaston of Buckingham came, and in the night, or perhaps about twilight, these persons were buried in baptism. He preaches the gospel. Nine people get saved. They contact another Baptist pastor who comes over and baptizes them. And by the way, you got people that won't cross the street to go to church. They won't drive an hour or two to go to church. They won't move to go to church, a good gospel preaching church. I don't believe you. I believe you have ulterior motives, and that's why you won't do it. Because when you're filled with the Spirit of God and you're moved by God's Spirit, you'll do what you have to to get into church. You just will. You'll do what you have to do. To support a ministry, to give to the Lord's work, support a church. You'll do what you have to do. You just will. The six-month stay of Pastor James Ireland in the Culpeper Jail is the most widely publicized case of ministerial imprisonment in the colony's history. 
This may be due to the fact that Ireland is the only one in that long list of persecuted Baptists who left an autobiography, whereas the conversion of Lewis Craig, Virginia's first imprisoned preacher, has been previously traced to the ministry of Samuel Harris. It is worthy to note that the colonel's first baptismal candidate was the distinguished James Ireland. Now, I've been to that Mackinac prison. I've been there to Culpeper Jail. I've been there. And I've also been to that Mackinac Island, I think it was. or Maybe I'm saying it wrong. My wife and I have been there. Where James Ireland was in prison. Amen. In the fall of the same year, 1769, notice the dates before America's founding. Before the Constitution, before the Bill of Rights. Get it? Now you start to understand the founding of America. You start to understand it? How it happened? This is why I tell people that there's nothing like this nation on earth. And it, beca- it isn't because of money or prosperity or anything else. It's because the way it was founded. It's because that it was a Baptist liberty of conscience, individual soul liberty. The free and unmolested preaching of the gospel. The First Amendment. given by God, recognized by the Constitution. That's why. And it produced the greatest revival this world has ever seen. Ireland was arrested at preaching at a preaching service during his closing prayer by two officials who seized him by the collar before he could even open his eyes, before he said amen. When he appeared in court to answer their charge of preaching without the proper credentials, the quorum of 11 magistrates declared that they would have no more of this vile, pernicious, abhorrible, detestable, abominable, diabolical doctrines as they were nauseous to the whole court. The convicted pastor sent his first night, spent his first night in conf- of confinement in a cell full of drunks. In the morning, he was informed by the Avarious jailer, a certain Mr. Stewart, who was also the local tavern keeper, that any visitors he might receive would have to pay a fee or four shillings and eight pence. Apparently, it was going to be a long six months. Because of the immense crowds that were assembling to hear Ireland preach through the greats, a number of plots were set in motion against him. Listen. A bomb was planted in his cell, which went off with a considerable noise, but the preacher was miraculously spared, testifying this. I was singing a hymn at the time the explosion went off. Ed continued singing until I finished it. On another occasion... His captors attempted to smother him by burning pods of Indian peppers filled with brimstone near the bottom of his cell door, stating that the whole jail would be filled with the killing smoke. Ireland recounted that the threatening situation would oblige me to go to cracks and put my mouth to them in order to prevent suffocation. So there were cracks in the walls, and he would go there, and he would breathe in the cracks to save his life so it didn't kill him. A scheme between the jailer and a certain doctor to poison the preacher almost met with failure. 
Also, excuse me. Let me read that again. A scheme between the jailer and a certain doctor to poison the preacher also met with failure. So, they tried to poison him. They got with a doctor and paid the doctor to poison him. Fine citizen. Citizens they were. The doctor and the jailer. Three years later, another attempt to poison Ireland at his home left one of his children dead. See, they tried to kill James, but they poisoned his poor daughter instead, and she died. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? Here he is, a preacher of righteousness, preaching the word of God. They couldn't get to him. They tried to get to him. They couldn't. So in trying to get to them, they killed his little girl. Despite these many hardships, the man of God testified. My prison then was a place in which I enjoyed much of the divine presence. A day seldom passed without some signal token and manifestation of the divine goodness towards me which generally led me to subscribe my letters to whom I wrote them in these words from my palace in Culpeper. Yes, Catholics do speak in tongues. Go see my series on the charismatic Catholics, uh, the reformed Catholics. There's a group of Catholics out there that were part of the tongues movement. It was part of Vatican II. And uh, yes, they do. And you can study the history of them. Go listen to the series on the charismatic movement. I cover it. David Cloud also covers it in, in one of his books on the, the history of the Pentecostal and charismatic churches. They absolutely do. And they were some of the main proponents of that. In fact, all through history... Uh, they did that. I cover that in that series. You can go back and listen to that series. It is in there. It's called the Catholic Charismatic Renewal. It was part of their movement. So you can go back and find that in the history of that. Go to sermonaudio.com slash Pastor Cooley. Click on there. Type in uh, uh, the Charismatic and you will find, and it goes back. It goes back to Vatican II, and it goes back to the mystics. The whole movement goes back to the history of the mystics. I covered it. Very essentially, or very, very specifically, all through that series. I show video of it, video examples of it, and uh, everything. If you go to the broadcast, you'll see the video examples on broadcast of what they were doing. And all through history, uh, through the Dark Ages, uh, the the mystics did it. Uh, the mystic Catholic believers did it all, uh, all the way through. So, yes. They were the main proponents of it. But James Ireland called it he signed his letters from my palace in Culpeper. At times, the divine presence was manifested through an unmistakable act of vengeance upon Ireland's tormentors. Listen to this. With reference to the miscreant who traveled 12 miles to retrieve the gunpowder for the failed bombing attempt, he wrote this. Listen. So the man that traveled 12 miles to retrieve gunpowder to kill James Ireland with. Listen to what happened. He with other two young men went to the backwoods to spend some time in hunting. 
as the three lay by the fire with their feet towards it, there came up a mad wolf. And although my persecutor lay in the middle, singled him out from the other two, bit him in the nose of which bite he died in the most wretched situation of the hydrophobia or canine madness. So that man that tried to kill James Ireland went out in the wood with, woods with his friends, slept between two of his friends. A rabid wolf came up, bit him on the tip of the nose, turned him into a psychopathic animal like happened to Nebuchadnezzar, and he died. While some of his enemies were laid low, others were brought under deep conviction. After doing everything to disrupt Ireland's services from having horses riding, ridden at a gallop over those in attendance to the securing of vile persons who made their water in his face. While he was preaching, the exasperated jailer succumbed to the kindness of his captain. captive. Ireland wrote this. He, with a number of his accomplices, were at the jail window going on with their abusive language when he applied to one of his companions for 10 shillings as he wanted some mere necessities against court for the tavern. He could not obtain that small sum from any of them, although they were generally applied to. I stepped to the window with the money in my hand and addressed him thus. Mr. Stewart, I have heard you appealing to your friends, applying to your friends for 10 shillings. And although unapplied to, I rest in your honesty. Here it is, if you will accept of it, and at any time hereafter when it suits you to return it, you may do so. He accepted of it immediately and struck with apparent astonishment and confusion. He made a kind of bow and retired. I perfectly gained him over to my friend that instant. Neither would he suffer any person to throw out a word of insult against me from that time without his resenting it he and his companions would repeatedly come in and visit me, at which times we often spent many hours together in friendly conversation. However, the greatest manifestation of the divine goodness of God towards Ireland developed into a classic case of poetic justice at its best. V.M. Fleming relates the rest of the story. Yeah, canine madness. That's not the same. Uh, that other one was lympho uh, Lyme phobia or something. I'm sorry about Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah, that's not the same thing. He was actually turned into wolf. He just turned rabid. Right, it was rabies. That's, that's the difference. I forgot what that's called. Sorry about that. Um, not lymphome. Uh, I can't remember it. But anyway. Near Culpeper, there lived a man named Arnold, who was the head of the per this persecution. He had a daughter named Amy, an attractive child of 12 or 14. The time we refer to was the time Mr. Ireland, a Baptist preacher, was confined in the Culpeper jail, put there by Arnold himself. In spite of all commands to the contrary, he spoke through the gratings of the jail windows. One morning, Amy, Arnold, asked her father to permit her to go to Culpeper two miles off to hear this wonderful man of God and an orator as well. Her father denounced her desire to go and forbade it, but the intercession of her mother prevailed. She started off with some other neighbors who lived about her. All these girls going barefooted until they had crossed the creek just beyond Culpeper when they stopped to put on their shoes and stockings. When they neared the jail, they heard the singing. Boys and girls and evidence everywhere in the trees and on housetops. As they approached the jail, they were singing that old time hymn as we journey let us sing praises to our heavenly king. When the preaching began, some word of the spirit sped its way to Amy Arnold's heart and she was converted. It is useless to go into the scene which transpired on her return home. They were severe indeed, as one can imagine. Her faith, however, stood firm, and she was baptized in the Baptist faith. 
After growing to womanhood, she moved with some of her friends to Charleston, South Carolina, where she married a man named Hamilton. By this marriage, there were many descendants, all Baptists and men of distinction, through whom to a large extent was the Baptist influence in the South spread. One of those was Judge Harrelson, who 10 or 15 years ago was president of the Southern Baptist Convention, than whom there was no man distinguished more in the South, and through whose influence the growth of the Baptist church was greatly enlarged. See, a lot of people couldn't understand why didn't they take the license? Why didn't they just take the license? Dr. George Beale explains why they didn't as deserving the pain of ignominy and of arrests and bonds and imprisonments and stripes. He said this, the right to preach the gospel was inalienable. And divine, quite beyond the pale of the court's jurisdiction or government's control. Therefore, whilst others took the prescribed oaths, subscribed to the necess necessary articles, and secured license from the court for certain preaching places, many Baptist preachers proceeded to preach as opportunities offered without consulting the general court and regardless of legal sanction. It was this bold and intrepid action that aroused against them the resentment of their clergymen, the rage of the magistrates, and the terror of the courts. It was this that led the fathers of our faith to suffer the stings of a cruel lash and to preach to their fellow men through the grated windows of our county jails. As faithful men who would preach without a violated conscience. But a growing number of disturbed onlookers would watch and it would bother them. And many would mock the Baptist. They would laugh at them and mock them. And they would make little of their persecution. Because they were guilty men. So... They even wrote in a newspaper, a recipe to make an Anabaptist preacher in two days' time. They mocked him. Here's what they would say. Here's what they wrote in the paper. Take the herbs of hypocrisy and ambition, of each a handful, and of the spirit of pride, two drams, of the seed of dissension and discord, one ounce, of the flower of formality, three scruples, of the roots of stubbornness and obstinacy, four pounds, and bruise them all together in the mortar of vainglory with the pestle of contradiction, putting amongst them one pint of the spirit of self-conceitedness. When it is lukewarm, let the dissenting brother take two or three spoonfuls of it, morning and evening before exercise, and whilst his mouth is full of the elestery, he will make a wry face, wink with his eyes, and squeeze out some tears of dissimulation. Then let him speak as the spirit of giddiness gives him utterance. This will make the schismatic endeavor to maintain his doctrine around, wound the church, wound the church, delude the people, justify their proceedings of illusions, foment rebellion, foment rebellion, and call it by the name of liberty of conscience. See, they're mocking him. But see, James Madison, he was paying attention. Those other patriots were paying attention. James Madison, Patrick Henry. And they didn't like it, the persecution that was going on. James Madison wrote of his disgust of the lack of religious liberty in the, in the colonies, in, in Virginia. He said this, I want again to breathe your free air, he wrote to someone. I expect it will mend my constitution and confirm my principles. I have indeed as good an atmosphere at home as the climate will allow, but have nothing to brag of of the state and liberty of my country. Poverty and luxury prevail among all sorts. Pride, ignorance, and knavery among the priesthood, and vice and wickedness among the laity. 
This is bad enough, but it is not the worst, I have to tell you. That diabolical hell-conceived principle of persecution rages among some. And to their eternal infamy, the clergy can furnish their quota of imps for such purposes. There are at present in the adjacent county not less than five or six well-meaning men in close jail for publishing their religious sentiments, which in the main are very orthodox. I have neither patience to hear, talk, or think of anything relative to this matter. For I have squabbled and scolded and abused and ridiculed so long about it to little purpose that I am without common patience. So I must beg you to pity me and pray for liberty of conscience to all. Not only did Madison side with the Baptists in his private correspondence, but like his colleague Patrick Henry, publicly defended them in courts throughout Virginia. In Johnson's New Universal Encyclopedia, Volume 3, page 201, Madison graduated from the College of New Jersey, and he returned to his home to Orange County, Virginia. Here's what he said. His attention was then absorbed by the impending struggle for independence, with which was closely connected in Virginia, a local controversy on the subject of religious toleration. The Church of England was the established state religion in the Old Dominion. And other denominations labored under serious disabilities, the enforcement of which was rightly or wrongly characterized by them as persecution. Madison took a prominent stand in behalf of the removal of all disabilities, re repeatedly appearing in the court of his own county to defend the Baptist nonconformists. Thomas Jefferson also, and by the way, we're not saying that Thomas Jefferson was a Christian either. But he looked at how Baptist church was ran. He said, that's right. As stated in an earlier chapter, Thomas Jefferson was also a careful student of Baptist church polity. Although Jefferson's own religious sentiments fluctuated between deism and theism, his sister and his favorite aunt were Baptist. Like Madison and Henry, he was deeply moved by the degree of suffering endured by these Baptist preachers. Observing such men as Pastor John Weatherford, who willingly entered the Gaul despite a dependent family of 15 children, 12 of whom were girls. Wow. John Weatherford had 15 children and 12 of them were girls. That is unbelievable. Made Jeffer it made Jefferson even more willing to check out the Baptist church. Armitage citing of Curtis says this. There was a small Baptist church which held its monthly meetings for business at a short distance from Mr. Jefferson's house. Eight or ten years before the American Revolution, Mr. Jefferson attended these meetings for several months in succession. The pastor on one occasion asked him how he was pleased with their church government. Mr. Jefferson replied that it struck him with great force and had interested him much that he considered it the only form of true democracy that existed in the world, and had concluded that it would be the best plan of government for the American colonies. This was several years before the Declaration of Independence. That so many Baptists were known to be suffering over matters of conscience was beginning to have a telling effect upon the conscience of the colony itself. The Culpeper Jail itself would eventually be converted into a Baptist church. Before the era of ministerial imprisonment, Old Dominion was the outstanding loyalist settlement. The Puritans in Massachusetts would have no dealings with their pro-Stuart cousins of the South. To the South, for these reasons, humanistic historians are at a loss to explain how Virginia came to the, be the first rank in, among the revolting colonies. In his notes on Virginia, Thomas Jefferson shared a statistic that is quite familiar to the Christian historian. As a backlash to Virginia religious intolerance, two-thirds of her population had become dissenters, Baptists, Quakers, and Presbyterians by the time of the Revolution. Armitage expands on the cause and significance of this political paradox. He says this, By the intolerable sufferings and indefatigable labors of the Baptist preachers, they had cherished and diffused their own love of liberty throughout the whole convention had deeper root than the feeling of the hour. It was grounded in those evangelical convictions which were shared by the majority of the people of Virginia. That Virginia cast her royalist attendant 
antecedents aside and loyally espoused the cause of the revolution was largely due to the fact that the Baptist suffering, preaching, and democratic practice had educated her people for the issue. Thomas Jefferson, possibly an advanced Unitarian, Patrick Henry, a devout Presbyterian, and James Madison, thought to be a liberal Episcopalian, felt the throb of the public heart, saw that its patriotism was founded upon religious convictions, and likewise men, instead of stemming the strong tide, they gave it their leadership, under which it swept on, notwithstanding the opposition of the English rectors and their entangling traditions of the grinding hierarchy. What happened? The Baptists and their suffering for preaching the gospel and planting churches influenced the entire settlement of Virginia, the entire future state of Virginia to turn away from the crown and turn away from the uh, uh, Anglicans and turn to religious liberty. That religious liberty in turn turned those people to get for liberty of, of conscience and for that to eventually move to the revolution itself. That is how America's Baptist foundations were set up. That's how you have a Bill of Rights in America today. That's why you have relig- you, you don't have the religious persecution that you have all over the world. Owed largely to the desire to preach the gospel and to plant churches and to believe what the Bible says not to persecute those that disagree with you or that are wrong, but to preach to them and warn them. Amen. Powerful stuff, isn't it? Very powerful. People don't even know it. They just don't even know. They have no clue. It's a sad thing, isn't it? is so great a God as our God. Thou art the God that dost wonders. Thou hast declared thy strength among the people. Who is like unto the Lord most high, who filled the seas and formed the skies, who walks upon the wings of Through 
Amen. All right, everybody. God bless you. And uh, we'll see you back on uh, Sunday. We'll have our we'll have one sermon on Sunday. We're going to have prayer Sunday afternoon, so it won't be a second sermon on Sunday. But uh, uh, we'll have our prayer service on Sunday afternoon uh, this Sunday afternoon. But uh, you can join us Sunday morning at 1045 a.m. Central Time uh, and uh, all that good stuff. But uh, pray for our ministry, if you would, please. We'd appreciate your prayers. Uh, and if you'd like to give to our ministry, uh, you may do so through PayPal, salvationpreacher at gmail.com, salvationpreacher at gmail.com, or you can give through Ven Venmo or Apple Pay. That's Pastor Cooley at iCloud.com. Uh, you can give through uh, Cash App. You can give through, uh, or you can mail us something. Our address is 1030 South Highway 3. Northfield, Minnesota, 55057. All right, everybody. God bless you. Take care. We'll see you soon. Hope you learned something from it.